Welcome, DEF CON 18, to your Stealing It Wrong 30 Years of Inter-Pirate Battles. My name is Jason Scott, and I am a historian. I'm going to dedicate this talk tonight to Ibrahim Kam Sharani, a friend of mine who attended DEF CON, uh, and two months later uh, had a really unpleasant car accident that did result in his death. This was, again, in 2004. What I'm saying now is, tonight, spend a little more time with friends you don't normally see, please. Enjoy your time at DEF CON with them. Keep your memories. So I deal in history, and of course, in history, you can see all sorts of parallels and unusual things. For instance, a 1929 lolcat advertisement here. <laughs> this is from an advertisement, uh, and it actually suggests, as you can see, it'll brighten up the whole room. Every mother will want one of these 5x8 photos for the nursery. Ha ha ha, it must be so. These, in fact, are Chicagoland gang business cards, a collection of cards handed out by gangs. Around here, the cross is boss, only a bitch wears makeup. I don't know what situation they would hand this to. I would assume to the person that was arresting them. But these sort of unusual ephemera kind of fascinate me as a person who likes to see things. So I'm always collecting items and unusual things, and I've been doing it for a very, very long time. History is important, like this beautiful idyllic scene between two models. Uh, this is a rather old photo. It is, in fact, a photo of Afghanistan from the 1950s. This is that exact same location today. Without those photographs, without people making an effort, without collecting items, we would have no idea about this past history. Again, 100 years ago, this was an article in the New York Times, which it was announced that an attorney general had decided that it was, there was no actual law against women wearing pants. A widow had written asking for permission to wear pants in her own garden, and the attorney general said, well, there doesn't seem to be any law against that. And as the last uh, part of the article says, uh, there's no law prohibiting a woman from wearing men's trousers, especially if she were the head of the house. <laughs> These kind of unusual phrases and stuff, it's all very kind of fascinating to me because you look at it now with new eyes, right? Everything you see is in three locations. The time it was written, the time it's being written for, and the time at which you're reading it yourself. So these are three different perspectives that these things exist in, and it's always a good idea to see what they're up to. This itself is from HoHoCon in the 1990s. This is a Denver trashing map. This is a collection of places that may or may not have good things to get out of the trash bins for freaks. For instance, Northern Telecom, well-concealed location, AT&T, nice trash. U.S. West, you know, not quite clear. Maybe some of these things are different areas. I, I, I wouldn't do this now, by the way. I'm just saying, don't do it now. Last year, I was assistant administration, uh, and I hated it. And uh, eventually, I was laid off. And so at that point, I said, boy, do I want to do that again? And I thought, well, not really. So I went to Kickstarter, and I proposed an idea, which was, I love doing computer history. I run a site called textfiles.com. I've done a documentary called BBS the Documentary. I've done a whole variety of these other things, which I'll show you. And um, would you guys like to fund me to do nothing but this for a while? And $25,000 later, people did. So I want to thank the 347 backers on Kickstarter. Without you, I wouldn't be able to spend the time on crazy shit like this. Some of you might be in the room. You need a hug. But I just wanted people to know that you know I am actually functioning as a full-time historian right now, and it's a wonderful life, and I'm enjoying it. How much am I enjoying it? <laughs> this is a photo of my brother. But behind him is a storage container, which I call the textfiles.com information cube. <laughs> this is a storage container full of computer history. That's when I started to load it in. It actually uh, looks like this right now, because I've been busy editing my movie, which is for sale, but anyway. So this is a collection of thousands and thousands of computer magazines, floppy diskettes, tape. I have... Uh, the original data tapes of the Free Software Foundation in there. There's a whole variety of artifacts, things, and, and I've been going through them, and I've posted them online. 
it's from these archives that I collect things that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show people. I believe that the biggest problem besides being at history when it happens is recognizing that it's not really your job to decide what the future finds fascinating. And so it's only because of people who are now dead that we understand a lot of different things in this world. So I'm trying to collect things and at least be a depot to be an alternative to the trash can to then pass it on to the next group of people. So I have entire collections of Byte, entire collections of Wired, entire collections of 2600, uh, a lot of 2600 pre-production items and so on. Just things that I think might have value in the future. I'll be the guy who safeguards them now. I don't own them. I merely curate them for the next generation. So this talk is about software and piracy. And you have to kind of define those terms. They're very easy terms to throw around. So I just wanted to spend a little time on them. Uh, because right now, when people do a lot of work, they kind of go for the surface of things, take it a little bit easy. And I like to try to at least dig a little bit deeper on that. So software. OK, so software is a little kind of a strange concept, right? Especially when you consider that you know, people think of software now as a career. They think of it as an environment, a product. They think of it as an actual thing that can be bought, sold, given around. You can be arrested for stealing it. You can be arrested for copying it. You know, it's, it's, it's this ephemeral concept. Um, I use a bunch of books when I'm doing research. This particular book is called, is, it has an awful title. It's called From Airline Reservations to Sonic the Hedgehog. Ignore that bullshit. I actually have a number of historical books that are just awful because publishers are idiots when they come to titles sometimes. And they say, your book is fascinating. It's deep and it's interesting. But we need to put Mario on the cover somehow. So they'll do this. And there's one called, like, Play. And it's actually a beautiful work on the video game industry. But it looks like something that's going to have 16 exclamation points after every sentence and just be awful. This book tries to track back the history of software going back to the 50s, and then how different software industries rose up and what that meant and where everything went. Obviously, most of you deal with software every moment of your lives now. Something inside of your pants runs software. Something inside of your car runs software. Maybe something inside of your chest runs software. So it's, it's a concept that has some amount of importance. So. I'm just going to go back to the 50s. You can trace concepts of software actually back to the 1800s with looms and punch cards. Uh, there's a beautiful uh, talk out there. Uh, and I got to see this at the Marble House in, in Rhode Island. There's a uh, silk covering on walls, this beautiful silk covering. And it had faded terribly over the 100 years that it had existed. It was a, it was a Vanderbilt built house. And they wanted to fix it. And they were trying to come up with different solutions. And they contacted the original firm in France that happened to have the original punch cards that originally ran the looms. So they ran another run of it and put up brand new exact duplicate silks. Save your shit. So <laughs> and I'm sure whoever put that back there was like, no, 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 they will reorder. <laughs> so. Anyway, so, so here we are. Uh, this, this is a beautiful podcast by the IEEE Computer Society called Computing Lives. I recommend it heavily. Um, it is basically the human stories behind computers. Uh, the first one is about the first computer dating program that was created uh, and, and how awful it went. And uh, a, a number of other things. But this discusses the concept of the origin of software bundling. I just want to know, so I know my audience, software bundling, what meaning? Does anyone understand that term before the 70s as opposed to now where it's like, I bought a software and the right to get sued to use it? All right. So here's the deal, right? Um, um, there's obviously parallel existences out there, but primarily people who are looking back at software will look at the practices of the International Business Machines Corporation, IBM. And IBM, when it sold software, certainly through the 1950s and 1960s, sold it as a bundle. That is to say, you bought a computer, and you also bought their assistance in making it useful. Because it was always a, a big deal to try to justify these insane fucking things. Who would buy a million dollar piece of hardware when they're just doing accounting? It's a tough sell 
IBM came up with a number of innovative cell routines, which is part of why their success. Now, bear in mind, in like the 1920s, there was already a person who they had a party for to celebrate his 50 years with the company. IBM is a very old, very smart company who is not really beholden to their people. It's this thing that kind of exists, which is why it's still around through a lot of pain and a lot of greatness. They, they're very innovative. So one of the things they would do, I, I didn't understand this until recently, was that they would sell you a computer that was really expensive for a third of its price, but they were allowed to use it at night and they would rent it out to other customers who couldn't quite afford buying it for a third. See, they were always trying to kind of bootstart this whole thing. So computing, uh, when it came to software, it was sold as a service. You bought the machine and when you were like, we're a company and we make you know, uh, uh, buggy whips, we don't know how long this is gonna last, and we're going to need this kind of accounting, they would send people over to take their software and write it for this machine for you and it was part of the service and you paid money for it. What happened was, was like by the 19, late 1960s, early 70s, a lot of companies are trying to uh, uh, get into that space and they're claiming IBM is a monopoly, that IBM is going after places that are uh, 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 selling software and claiming it's violating their contracts and it's terrible. And that's how IBM ended up in their antitrust uh, court case. I swear this gets more interesting. I do. So. Um, basically, IBM unbundled software. They turned software into a separate concept and started selling it that way. Now, other companies had done that, but when IBM did it, suddenly software no longer becomes a service. It becomes its own special entity, not beholden to any particular company. So if you think of a car company also selling the gas, and suddenly now there's gas companies, right? Same idea. That's, that's kind of a, so it's a, it's a different way of thinking of software. With the advent of the home computer revolution, and I'll get to that in a moment, with the advent of the home uh, uh, computer revolution, suddenly software is something that's kind of coming along, but there's no company to kind of support you. So you're kind of on your own putting together software. But now software is something that if a company comes along and sells a product for it, suddenly all of the hobbyist approach to it of like, we'll just do what we need to do to get the software running, is running straight up against the idea of making a business out of it. And that's where we hear of the famous Bill Gates 1975 letter to hobbyists which says basically, please allow me to make an awful fuck ton of money. Signed, Bill. <laughs> I guess they fell for it, huh? Um, so basically this software company, the software idea starts rising up. Along with that comes home computers. Suddenly you're not dealing with a company you can push around that has rules of licenses and lawyers. These are just regular human beings who are buying computers as you would buy a vacuum cleaner. You would go to Sears and buy a game of Sari and a hula hoop and a Commodore 64, right? It's just another thing. And suddenly you're running up against this idea of software as being something you don't want to duplicate and do yourself. But it's so fucking easy. So right now in the contemporary space as we say there is an awful lot of verbiage talking about piracy and open culture and how do you you know what rights are you given creative commons a lot of buzzwords and a lot of concepts behind it now i find it easier to grab a distance instead of just punching cory doctorow in the nutsack or something i just would prefer to go back in time to a different more innocent time so here is an ad this is a public service announcement. Uh, I want to say it's about 1984, 1985. It's easy to make a copy. It's quick. It's illegal. It's wrong. Okay? Let's go a little farther here. And again, I want to point, point out this verbiage, mostly because it should have echoes of today. It's hard to believe. People who wouldn't think of shoplifting a software product on their lunch hour don't think twice about going back to the office and making several illegal copies of the same software. Making unauthorized copies of software is a violation of U.S. copyright law. Yet the problem has reached epidemic proportions because many people are unaware or simply choose to ignore the law. The software industry is urging decision makers and software users to take steps to stop software piracy in their organizations. In the meantime, the industry has been forced to prosecute willful copyright violators. There are legal, moral, and economic imperatives forbidding theft of copyrighted software. All of this, of course, echoes common arguments made today about you're destroying everything. Right? 
Every time you copy a PlayStation game, a baby gets punched. <laughs> Down here on the bottom it says, there is a free pamphlet on the subject. Call or write for a copy, a copy, a copy. A copy for everyone you know. Please ask for Priscilla. Just so I can explain, because I'm, I, I have to say I'm, I'm free associating on this, but I'm very sure that the reason they ask for Priscilla is to verify which people are reading which magazines and that the woman in question doesn't actually exist. But I still love her. <laughs> but here's also what kind of interests me when, when I look back at it in this time is ADAPSO. What the fuck is ADAPSO, right? Turns out ADAPSO is the Association of Data Processing Service Organizations. It's been around since 1962, okay? So this was an organization that was associated with uh, uh, an industry collective dealing with issues that were pervading an entire industry. This is how things get done. If you look at other similar organizations, the Business Software Alliance, the Software Publishers Alliance, um, first of all, uh, the SPA the, uh, has been renamed to the Information Industry, so actually, let me get this right. BSA still exists, fuckers. SPA was created in 1984, and then IIA, which is the Information Industry Association, which is a little bit before it, they combined, and now this organization still exists, the SIIA, the Software and Information Industry Association. Oh, that's awesome. So these guys are where companies have things done that they don't want to be associated with, you see? They are the ones who whine. They're the ones who threaten to sue. And it, yes, of course, they're being funded entirely. But there's that little layer of protection. And if something goes wrong, they deal with it. And there's a lot of pressure. While doing research for this, I found this rather interesting ADAPSO reunion workshop held by the absolutely wonderful Computer History Museum, which is out in California and has been making an effort to get oral histories with a lot of people and collect them. So. I just happened to take part of their um, their transcription, and it just mentions here that the Adapso board had a heated discussion because of the software companies. Microsoft and a handful of other set software vendors said, we want to bring a series of lawsuits against major corporations in America for illegally copying our software, and we're looking for a trade association to work with us on it. We insist on your funding support and the use of your name. And there was a very heated discussion. So basically, they came to them and said, please be our front because we're about to punch a lot of companies in the face and we don't want to be known for doing that. That's kind of interesting, but actually what's much more interesting is way down here is this discussion where the lead uh, uh, counsel for SPA found that they weren't moving fast enough and they moved to the BSA to become, oh sorry about that, they left the DAPSO to go with SPA, okay? And they took with them many of the legal arguments and writings that the SP, uh, the SP, um, the DASPO has put together to fight software piracy and then used them. So they go, did you steal the idea? No, no, no. It was entirely reverse engineered. So, so basically, an anti-piracy group pirated an anti-piracy group out of their anti-piracy language to fight piracy. <laughs> it, it helps a lot to talk to people years after things happen because then they go, oh yeah, we were assholes, sorry about that. It's very informative, especially if, uh, like some people I've talked to, they've had their lives ruined by lawsuits of de dealing with privacy, uh, piracy. All right. So one of the side effects of that is you get some really awesome propaganda, right? Nail your boss or colleagues, suppliers, dealers, and others who illegally copy software, $5,000 reward. Uh, sim similarly over here, be a big fat hero in glasses. Report, you don't have to leap tall buildings a single bound. Fighting crime, righting wrongs, doing the right thing. You too can be a superhero and you take a stand against software piracy. These are all feelers, right? They've defined Stealing piracy is something awful, and you can be a part of it, okay? This is an environment of fear and intimidation that's brought on by propaganda. This one's very recent. This is in the Philippines. A uh, nice reboot of the whole process, right? These guys are looking like badasses. Until you look down on the bottom left and you see he's the chairman of the Optical Media Board. 
Uh, and the guy on the right, whew, Director of National Bureau of Investigation. Um, and up there, you know, 139 businesses were raided, 85 businesses were inspected, 1,686 computers were seized. So basically they're saying, you know, look out, your entire business could be ruined if you have one illegal copyrighted software. Now this does get to some pretty ludicrous levels. Uh, in 2000, the BSA put vans in various locations in England and said they were scanning buildings for illegal software and advised you to report immediately that you were stealing software so their van detectors would not find you. However, I am funded by these wonderful people for my sabbatical, so I spent a little more time on this than just going, ha ha, the register made fun of the BSA. And I found that in 1998, Microsoft funded with $20 million an educational research project in which Ross Anderson, who has said in the thing, I hope they never use it, uh, funded a way to send alternate signals from what's on the screen via radio transmission. So that on the left, it looks like this, and on the right, it's sending a completely different signal. The idea being that each piece of software would have this implemented and be able to, again, in software it's doing this, send out its serial number constantly, enabling you from within 200 to 300 feet to know the serial numbers of all the machines around you. So someone did try this shit. It actually did sort of exist. However, they never went forward with it. But what the fuck, let's deploy a van fleet anyway. <laughs> so there you go, right? So never question everything without checking in first. But I just put this in here because everyone knows about it, right? Here's a case of just this awful music video that's going to make you pirate things. Uh, but they made it for free, so you'd copy it. So. So, obviously, when you live in an environment of such fear, intimidation, and rotten music videos, eventually people just start using your own methodology against you. They start using bizarre language, harshness, making fun of things, all this kind of gallows humor to get around the fact that there's this awful amount of threats and everything around you, right? So, you know, in fact, there's all of this stuff that's been written and created in various degrees, right? And it's not, you know, not everything I say has to fall with the general theme of the audience. I don't see any moral or logical advantage over the other companies when this is done. I think this is just as much propaganda as the other. Because it diminishes actual work being done by creators that they're trying to do good things. And it makes it sound like every single movie sucks. Every single creator is awful. So you have to keep an eye out. It's funny, but don't copy this floppy is funny. This is funny, this entire crazy thing here. But on the other hand, people are creating stuff and they want to protect it and they want to do stuff. It's all a matter of how do we go about it. That's as far as I'm going to go into that debate because it tires me. And if it tires me, I can imagine what it does to you. So, hooray. All right, so throughout the work that I do, I collect a whole bunch of things, and one of the things I've always had a kind of a soft spot for were Apple II software pirates. There's something about them just I really kind of enjoyed that. I didn't own an Apple II when I was a kid, but somehow I was fascinated at just the creativity and the work. So a few years ago, I went ahead through a few thousand um, uh, pirated Apple II products that I have since deleted, and I <laughs> built this uh, collection of crack screens. And I'm just going to quickly explain what crack screens are, just for a moment, just for whoever. Okay, who doesn't know what crack screens are? All right, exactly. So, um, um, crack screens are, uh, when software first comes out, it was fucking huge. It could take you an hour or more to download your 143K floppy across modem lines. It was a 
unneeded effort to do this. So often, floppies that were created by commercial software creators would actually not have a lot of data. You might have a 143K floppy, but actually it would only have 20K of useful data on it. Uh, and so what happened is, is that people could just duplicate the whole disk through an entire industry, which I'll go into for a little bit, but you would end up with this large, hard to transfer thing. Well, here, you could also have someone who had some skills go through it, take the software off the disk or through memory, and then create a much smaller bundle that could be transferred much quicker, i.e. crack it. This was also the case if they built in protections. I spent many years talking to software pirates from the Apple II era. Uh, all sorts of fellows, very smart. For instance, they would design new boot ROMs inside Apple IIs that looked like a normal boot ROM because it was being checked by the software. And then as soon as it detected that the, 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 the searchlight had gone away from it, it would turn into a pirated thing and grab down the software. So there was a whole bunch of work done on this. And there were uh, uh, hacker and cracker magazines dedicated to software cracking. For instance, the beautiful hardcore computist, later renamed to simply computist, which I have an entire archive of with their permission. And it has both products and instructions on cracking software. So here we go. When you cracked it, why just stop at cracking it? Why not brag about how fucking awesome you are? I figured this was an urge that might have some sort of symbiosis with the people in this room. So people would create these crack screens. What you're seeing here are all screens that were created by crackers or cracking groups to say, what you're about to play is something I stole. You're welcome. Now, initially, you would have pretty basic ways of doing this. For instance, this is a crack screen where basically when you loaded up uh, the software, you would blow it into screen memory for a moment, so it would cause the screen to flip out. And these guys would put their own name buried in the text, so it would show up at the top of the screen. And you'll notice the use of the modified copyright, so it's K for cracked. So cracked, high technology, and creative cracker, the Apple Mafia strikes. Don't try to decode the rest. Don't waste the time. Stop! These guys are nuts. I put this in just because I wanted you to get some perspective on these software pirates that were just absolutely able to go everywhere. If you look on the bottom, it says, dedicated to the war don who's gone at summer camp for eight weeks. <laughs> Gonna pour some Kool-Aid on the ground for my friend. <laughs> Poor guy. But otherwise, here are bulletin boards to call. Notice they've got the password so nobody would break into their software piracy collections. Uh, active, NASCOMP, Aussie. So, but you can see it was cracked on June 22nd, 1984 by the Zap Man and distributed by the, by the Doc and the Ace. And that means that they would physically call a ton of computer bulletin boards around the country and leave copies of this with their, with, with, with their pride and regards. So, and the problem, of course, is that sometimes you run out of interesting things to crack, and you're always trying to kind of get a name for yourself. So here we see someone has blown out this awesome ware, the Department of Transportation National Highway Traffic Safety Administration Self-Evaluation for Teens. Bring that one on, huh? He will be shown 40 statements representing attitudes concerning drinking and driving. I'm for it! Type the response number, it'll be displayed in the graph. So this was the thing. Could you imagine showing up the gates of some ASCII Express or bulletin board line and going, I got a hot new wear for you. <laughs> Let me go into this for a moment, by the way. Uh, what would happen is, is that a piece of software would be released on a certain day. Uh, you know, we'd know that it was coming out on June 5th. But if you were a cracker group and you somehow got your hands on it a few days before, you would say, I got this thing before anybody else. But that usually didn't happen. Nobody had an in at that time. So what they would do instead is say, this has been out for four days. This is a four-day wear. And then it would be, I have a three-day wear. And then if you were able to release your pirated software in the early 80s before anybody else, and before it was in the stores, it was called a zero-day wear. Somehow this has turned into an entire fucking industry. 
and it drives me nuts to see zero day being used this way, but what are you going to do? Now it's like on like fucking stickers on packages, but assholes. <laughs> part, part, of, part, of, part of being a historian is that you quickly learn to become a hater of all things. And you realize we're on a small boat in a world of shit and there's a leak. But I soldier on. What would happen is, originally they're just kind of having fun with it, right? And they're cracking and they're letting you know about their incredible software. No, dude, it gets better. And everyone say goodbye to the creator of Zero Day products. And Tell your dad I said hi. Anyway, so here, Crack Man cracked things, right, and tells people that it was supplied by Reese's Pieces, Reese's Pieces which is a terrible name for a pirate, but what are you going to do? Buttercup was taken. And it was protected by a commercial product called Lock It Up 50, and he goes, what a joke, right? So not only is he sufficient to crack it, but he's also got to say, and they were stupid when they did it. Fuckers, right? That is a very noticeable shift. That's from, dude, we did it, to, they didn't, that wasn't even a challenge, motherfucker. Bring it on. This led to something called spiral tracking, which I'm not going to go into right now. Anyone know spiral tracking? Oh, boy, and your eyes still work? All right, fine. Spiral tracking was where they changed how the, the drive worked so that, in fact, it would write in a spiral instead of a series of tracks. It would actually go in a spiral. All right, so if you used any other software except for the software itself to figure out what it was, it looked jambled. And it was a big, happy, wonderful day in Pirate Land when someone figured this out and everyone else got it. Again, these guys are now turning towards the very places that are assaulting them to say, or, 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 or saying that it's terrible to do to go, fuck you. So here they're going, yeah, we're totally guilty of software piracy. It's a presentation. All right? And then we get this, right? Recracked by the disc jockey. Learn to crack right freeze. Also, if you take out the author's name again to put in yours, I'll break all your arms and legs, no kidding. <laughs> Sincerely, the disc jockey. Now they're turning on each other, right? Now you're seeing this thing with, not, not only are they like, fuck you, but they're going to each other and going, fuck you. <laughs> this is not a long-term success plan, but here they are doing it, right? Similarly, once again, Here's a case where it's like cracked by hot rod of black bag. Black bag was awesome, by the way. But on the left and right, there's laws and torch hanging by their hands. Fuck those guys. Enjoy Captain Goodnight. Fuck laws and the torch. All right, interesting message. They didn't stop with it either. Here's the torch getting... <laughs> Space Station. <laughs> Yellow beard. Anyway, so... Now, also the credits are kind of fun, aren't they? You got someone who cracked it, you got thanks handed out, and the title page is now being done by a separate guy, right? Just so we go off for a moment, understand that after a while, you start having people who are doing nothing but making title screens. You have people who are doing nothing but making cool programs that run before the main program run, and then we have what we now call the demo scene. That's where it comes from, just so you know. Because what happened is, eventually the guys making the title screens were like, fuck you pirates, you don't even have good distribution. I'm just making cool title screens for no good reason. Yeah! <laughs> fuck you! <laughs> that long-term strategy actually worked. So they ended up not going to jail and having demo scene. So I just wanted to pass that out because the demo scene rules. So ragging. Here's a bunch of home phone numbers of other pirates. Including Hitman's mom. The Bits Mom, rag on all these losers. Some of you are like third trimester embryos. Do you still use the term rag at all? Is rag still a verb? Eh, okay, good. Um, just checking. Got to keep up with the kids, you know. Hey, rag on these guys. So yeah, what you're seeing here is ragging. The idea of ripping on... Why am I using a definition where I use an even more obscure term? Why the fuck did I just do that? Insulting fellow members of your community. You're ragging on them, fucking losers. 
Why not put their phone numbers on a cracked piece of software that you cracked and are distributing throughout bulletin boards? Notice also it's giving their real first names too, right? Ask for Casey, ask for Ike, ask for Ben, ask for Ken, ask for Hitman's mom. <laughs> also, I'm fairly sure, and again, this is an analysis from a ways away, when it says fake Sandman, be aware that at the time there was a lot of credence put into your handle. So if two people chose a name, you know, a, a really unique name like Sandman, you would track that motherfucker down and tell him to stop it. I know this is true because I did it. Uh, a long time ago, I was the Slip Disc, and I found someone was using the name Slip Disc, and I called him up, and why did he have that name? Because he had a Slip Disc. So I let him off pretty easy. <laughs> Sorry, dude. This is also located in a crack screen. This is a crack screen. This is like you're about to play a game, and you're suddenly hit with a digital dictionary. Loser, one that is a failure and achieves nothing. One who continually releases unprotected, lame educational wares. See also the bunny man. You know we did use to spell wares with an S, right? Yeah, okay, good. Incompetent, lacking qualities needed for a task, often cracking. See also the bunny men. Conceited, having an excessively high opinion of oneself, ragging on almost every wear one puts out, feeling superior to all. See also the bunny men. Ignorant, lacking in knowledge and intelligence, unable to crack wares by oneself, one who must use other loaders due to incompetence above. See also the bunny men. Bunny men, incompetent, highly conceited losers, often displaying outright ignorance. I'm going to let you finish that, but Dan Kaminsky had one of the best talks of all time. Do, do I get to come back later and get my applause? Anyway. Fuck the Benny Man. Fuck the Bunny Man! Alright, so basically this, this is the middle page of a three-page letter that I found in front of one crack. In which he tries to indicate, okay, one thing I don't like lately is all the rags being put out on the new formed group Dark Logic. First off, I think it's childish to rag on anybody. I hate the idea of rag pages, but I don't think it's fair for a new group to get ragged on when they're just trying to compete in the world of piracy. I don't know all the group members. However, I do know three of them, and two of them I consider good friends. These people are Back Bay Hacker and The Martyr. Both these guys are very cool people. They'll do anything for anybody. Mike has sent me numerous 2GS wares, and I have traded with Keith a few times as well. They're both caring people. I don't think they deserve the shit they are getting from anybody. The other guy I know in Dark Logic is Brian Fisk. I'm sure most of you know who he is, as he's been becoming fairly well known lately. I don't know him all that well, but there's more. Anyway, so... Calls for reasonableness have not worked in 400 years. I don't know why this guy's doing it. Eventually, people feel a need to leave. So here we have the retirement notice of Silicon Warrior. First of all, I'd like to say, what up, dudes? But now I am depressed. I'm quitting piracy. It has never been a real experience for me. I will. It has been a real experience for me. I will never forget. I'd like to say thanks to all my old and new friends I met in piracy. It's been a blast. Later, dudes. It's been awesome. No E. Thanks to One Eye, the Atom, the Cog, all the LSD members who gave me my break, to my cracker, to my cracker's hot rod, the Micron, the cloak, and any other I have missed. Thanks to all the cracksmith, the IC. I just like to thank all the old pirates. All right, this is 1984. <laughs> I like to thank all the old pirates of 1200 Club, MPG, and so on. Thanks to everyone else who was my friend. You know, quote, "You're my idol," and "Fuck you, Larry." SW. We'll miss you, Silicon Warrior. Similarly, Crackman, uh, during a very tearful moment of Super Zexon, cracks it with thanks to the dealer and the Scantron. Says, this is the last major wear that I, Mr. Crackman, will crack for the Apple II. I am disappointed in the quality of software slash crackers slash traders in the pirate world now, and I'm only going to crack Mac stuff. I need more Kool-Aid. What I want to show here is there's a lot of parallels in this bizarre bubble world to what we experience now and this weird way people look. And I think that one of the things I try to get across to people, right, is that 
a lot of times people get really wrapped up in the problems of the moment, right? Uh, some controversy, some thing. And they don't realize that these are just echoes of problems that we've all been grappling with for years, ever since man first put together silicon to a disk and started playing asteroids. So it, these, are, these, are, these are both new and old problems and should be considered as such and not to get too hung up on them. But it's fascinating to look back on the perspectives. These are little tiny machines that are getting such huge, huge fights. All right, you're all like, yeah, that guy who left, he's sorry. Oh, he's back. All right. What the fuck did you leave for then? Uh, oh, oh, you, oh, you got to, you had to drink a little before you could take the rest of my speech. Because this speech doesn't get much better if there's two of me. I'm just saying. All right, anyway, so you're all like, awesome, Jason, but please focus in on that good part. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Mirzim and Karen Van Bleeble uh, on Playboy, September 1989, available at Rusty and Edie's. 14 lines, 762 megs. <laughs> Columbus, Ohio. Rusty and Edie. It's a different kind of BBS. We're the friendliest BBS. Okay, so Rusty and Edie's was one of the largest computer bulletin boards in the 1990s. We're moving forward to the 1990s now. And you, what you had was computer bulletin boards, of course, were originally single line affairs run by hobbyists. But over time, an industry started to pile up. And then there became what I call super BBSs. BBSs in which you'd have more than, say, 20 lines, 30 lines, 40 lines, 60 lines. Bearing in mind that multi-user systems are not in vogue yet meaning a system per line. So they have, a, they have a whole bunch of ads, and they let you know about what they've got. And one of the things they mention is they have three gigs of adult graphics. Now, this is, 19, this is 1994, all right? They are fucking rocking it, right? <laughs> We're a couple burnouts in the 60s. We didn't like rules then, and we don't now. We live by three no's. No censorship, no rules, no hassle. Yeah. Now, I know some of you were like, that's right, put up your feet and enjoy yourself, it says, okay? And you're like, well, what the fuck did that look like? Oh, I have to mention this too, by the way. Uh, in this perspective of looking back on things, numbers are pretty crazy stupid. So I just put this in here just to mention 10 megabytes, $695. That's your only question. It's only $695? Anyway, I've kept you in suspense enough. What does the Rusty and ED BBS look like? It actually looks like this. I don't, I don't, I don't want to leave the screen yet, but okay, if you look over to the right, you see that everyone see the screen on the far right, all right? Put your eyes halfway between that screen and the bank of modems. Those are V32 modems inside those little custom-built things next to the ton of power supplies. That's a cat. That's a sleeping cat. Just wanted to mention that, okay? So that each one of those modems is going to one phone line, going down to one of those, I would assume, 486s, perhaps 386s, pumping out an awful lot of heat, and that is in their house, okay? All right, and it was this was long before they would bust you for being a meth lab, right? <laughs> but their heat signature, man, they were a fucking supernova, right? <laughs> All right, and I just wanted to say that, by the way, I mean this was not this wasn't a unique thing. I didn't just find you the seven wonders of the world. This is actually the Software Creations BBS at around the same time where they've custom built their house to accommodate the 10 billion machines that are in there. All right. This is how a lot of these places existed. There was a Channel One BBS in, in Boston, which had a, uh, a couple rooms dedicated to it, and then they had to dedicate more, and eventually they had to move out of the house and give it over to their BBS. And they bought a building behind their house, and that became their house. <laughs> but these are not just minor people saying, oh God, the 60s, right? These are like major, major businesses. Well, here we come. Here's Playboy Enterprises versus Russ Hardenberg, Russ, Rusty and Edie, 1997, in which they said, you have 412 graphic image, images that are basically Playboy scans. And this was a real lawsuit, 1997. He lost, lost fucking big, and he 
their arguments are interesting. They had arguments like, because it's scanned, it's a new image. Uh, we had no control over what was coming on our board. Uh, we have no rules. We have no hassle. We're from the 60s. Let us off. But what they said was, you curate your work. You curate your work. Um, now, there was a, they also cited a previous one, uh, George Freyna, Tech Warehouse, BBS Systems and Consulting. So Playboy was doing this. This is from 1993. So they were basically going on and finding people were scanning Playboy images and then selling them. I had a wonderful story on the BBS documentary. Uh, there was another major BBS exec PC. And when these lawsuits came down, the guy flipped out because the vast majority of their business was transferring adult images. And what are we going to do? How do we know these are Playboy images or not? So they assigned a guy who I interviewed who for three weeks looked at pornography <laughs> and if the models looked, quote, too good, he would delete it. And he said, I have never seen that many vaginas in my life with this wide-eyed fear. And he's like, it was really only stimulating for the first couple of days. But as an interesting parallel to what we're talking about now, Russ Hardenberg versus Playboy, where he lost because they said, because you curate stuff, you must be aware of its legality, therefore you are liable, is what was cited to take down Napster. Hardenberg versus Playboy is one of the citations to win over Napster because they were doing some level of curation of their wares, and so that peer-to-peer -peer network was taken down due to that. So there's always something kind of there to bite you on the ass and pay attention to. Again, I love watching history this way. So it's kind of fun, you know, and you say eventually, oh, well, of course, people get it. And then you go, oh, I guess they really don't get it, huh? Anyone still using their super mini floppies? 3.3 megs on one five and a quarter diskette? Oh, well. High capacity, field proven. Anyway, oh, and reliably transportable. That's an awesome, awesome sales. Anyway, so. A little while, or oh, a few years ago, about a year or two ago, I got this mail from a guy. Now, and again, I must say this, by the way, this is one of the greatest pieces of uh, my life, my current life and the life I've lived, right, is that people go, where do I send this? Maybe you should send it to Jason Scott. It's nice to have that reputation. It really makes me feel good. It literally makes me feel good. I, I have found citations by using a blog search where someone goes, I want to get rid of a bunch of shareware CDs. What do I do? And someone writes, give them to the Jason Scott. And because my thing triggers, I show up a minute later and go, I'm here. <laughs> what you got? I'll pay pal you shipping. Hey. As a result, there was something called cd.textfiles.com, which you guys not, may not be aware of. It's 400 gigabytes of shareware uh, that I've collected over the past few years. I'm going to be putting up another 200 gigs of shareware in the next couple of months because I've got it waiting to go up. Um, and so I love collecting that stuff. And there was so much treasure in shareware. I mean, there's so much treasure in there, so many things. When Duke Nukem was canceled, I ended up grabbing Duke Nukem 2 and putting it up for everyone, you know? And you could see how Duke Nukem grew through the years and what it all meant. So it's great when I get these mails. I love these fucking mails. They're awesome. So I got this mail from a guy. Let's go with a guy. And it said, hey, Jason, I saw something go by on my torrent site that you might want. Um, it's a collection of pirate notices. And I said, oh, fuck yeah, sure, dude, whatever. And he goes, I'm going to give you a one-time token to our pirate server so you can grab it. And I had Fios at the time. I hit this server, and I'm getting 12 meg download speeds. All right? Which is why I didn't initially notice that it was 1.6 gigs pirate notices. What the fuck are pirate? I, thinks I should have it. Fuck yeah! <laughs> Shove it down. I'll eat it. Make it stop moving. I'll suck it down. So I get this huge collection of, of releases. All right? Just massive amounts. I mean, there's like thousands in this collection of this guy, right? And it's got great titles into it, like Fucker Who Almost Screwed Me. 
ban this stupid user. Scene release standards. Call out to all German XVID groups to reorganize. All right? What this guy gave me was the inter-office memo of the pirate scene. The bitch slappinest collection of hatred, anger, and misanthropy that I've ever seen. All right? And I thought, well, Jesus Christ, I got my talk for next year. <laughs> Hooray! Free admission. Um, so this is what we got here. And I'm just going to go through a few of these. I'm just going to go through this collection just because I think it's just absolutely fascinating. So this is, this is all circa 2004, okay? Uh, about 2004. And the rag pages have gotten more colorful. They've certainly got more explicit. <laughs> and they have a lot more drugs involved. <laughs> drugs, guns, money, and teddy bears. <laughs> Why, you say, Jason? I don't know. I got no idea what this fucking shit is. I don't even understand the context of this. I think CMS is one of the groups as a way of saying, ha-ha, we have illegal shit with your name on it, or something. I don't know what the thinking is, but I don't know. Teddy bear with gun, it just brings up memories. Anyway, so here's this interesting situation. Um, it, it, it doesn't behoove me to go too far into the lingo and whatever of, of pirate groups to too much extent. It's a lot of it out there, and I'll give a link soon. But th this is an example of a proof, OK? A proof is where you show that the thing you pirated or are distributing to other pirate groups or within the scene is real. So what this is is, this is an example of, an, uh, this guy says, I'm, well, I'll, I'll give you his letter in a moment because it's so brilliantly written. What he is trying to tell you is all the people who said we stole our pirated ware of this electronica MP3 here is a promo record that we received and intercepted, allowing us to have a copy before anybody else, which we have now ripped and are sharing. Okay? So he's got a picture of the label, and on the back he's showing you what the other label looked like, and here's the full uh, entry on the bottom with the name blocked out so nobody gets in trouble of this release, along with this beautiful letter, some of which I'll read. Just a little bit. <clears throat> I gotta get into the voice. I have to become this man. Okay, where should I begin? I guess it should be with you, the mighty full of sperm ripper of MFS, of course. Hey there, little cocksucker. I'm sure you have cold sweat in your forehead as you read this lovely proof release of ours. Now you're probably asking yourself, why, why, why did I try to be such a crappy smartass and mess with the best? Let me guess, because you own a really tiny dick. And for you sheepers who follow Newbie Ripper, who thought he could save the day, shame on you! Now on to the rest of the scene ops and our lovely fans all over the world. We would like to thank you for your support, and at the same time, shit on you sheepers! MNS particularly, you tiny little MS Ripper, go back to your cave and die! And all of the mighty nukers out there, you better not be thinking you can get us down because of some funny nukes! And so on and so on. What's that? I'm out of time? For what? What's coming before? What? Hacker Jeopardy? I am completely out of time? You gave me no warning? Clingo.wordpress.com Lots and lots of nuking each other by giving away their own information. Lots of CSI-like attacks on each other, revealing each other's IP addresses. Wave analysis to show that they stole each other's releases. We will provide proof that the other group is faking their releases by showing you that their various GIFs have been photographically mo modified in Photoshop. And of course, the glorious Lamer Hall of Shame is proud to present these guys, where, because they had an insider on a software company, they were able to see another group card, use a credit card to buy a copy of the software. They traced it back, and they narc him out. 
appears the first time that they discover about those dots that are in screens that we see right now, the cigarette burns that tell you exactly which movie theater is showing which movie, so they can trace it back down and figure out who is telesyncing. So what the good goddamn do we learn here? First of all, be more clear in telling me how much time I have. Strike! But also, I just, again, wanted to show you guys that there is a case of uh, just a, a scene, any scene, one that you're part of, one that you're not part of, can be a nest of ludicrousness and a lot of hatred when, in fact, you are all united in ripping shit off. <laughs> and to maybe show a little bit more love for your common thieves and the way that you feel about each other, that's all I ask. I'm Jason Scott. I guess that's it! <laughs>